income tax 2023-2024. Other income part number two. Get ready and some coffee so we can do some tax interpretation with income tax preparation 2023-2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our Accounting Rocks product line. If you're not crunching cords using Excel, you're doing it wrong. A must-have product. Because the fact, as everyone knows, of accounting being one of the highest forms of artistic expression means accountants have a requirement, the obligation, a duty, to share the tools necessary to properly channel the creative muse. And the muse, she rarely speaks more clearly than through the beautiful symmetry of spreadsheets. So get the shirt, because the creative muse, she could use a new pair of shoes. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Most of this information can be found in the Instructions for Schedule 1 section of the Form 1040 Instructions Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Looking at the income tax formula, we're focused on line one income. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula is basically a funny income statement. Most of the time, income statement having income minus expenses resulting in net income. Here we have income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income. We typically want for taxes income to be as low as possible, therefore looking for things that could be excluded from income. Sometimes certain income items might have more favorable tax rates as well, such as the qualified dividends possibly and capital gains or long-term capital gains. Looking at the first page of the Form 1040, we're looking at line number eight, additional income from Schedule 1, line 10. Here is the Schedule 1 additional income and adjustments to income that would feed into that first page. We're looking at line number eight, where it's listing out various other items which possibly aren't as common and therefore grouped under other income. So we're continuing on with those, looking at line number 8 in section 951A uh, inclusion. So section 951 generally requires that a U.S. shareholder of a controlled foreign corporation include in income its pro rata share of the corporation's subpart F income and its amount determined under section 956. Now, this is typically going to be more of a complex situation, possibly in areas where you're dealing with people who have a lot of possibly foreign income or more wealthy individuals. So this is another area where you ask the question, what kind of specialty do I want to be working in on? Do I want to be taking on more complex kind of tax returns or do I want to be specializing in a certain area or section of the tax uh, preparation? Noting that most people, when they make investments like normal investors are investing, possibly not even in individual stocks oftentimes, or although even if they are, it will be on you know uh, publicly traded stock exchanges usually, but most people are investing in like uh, mutual funds and ETFs, which are a way to kind of pool the investments together. And further, most people are often using tools such as a 401k, uh, an IRA and so forth. So in any case, enter on line 8N from your form 5471, the sum of any amounts reported on schedule one, lines 1A through H and line two. Remember to attach copies of your form uh, 5471 to your return. Line 8O, section 951A, inclusion. So section 951A generally requires that a U.S. shareholder of a controlled foreign corporation include in income its global intangible low tax income, G-I-L-T-I, which again is often something that you wouldn't see for normal type of investors 
to have a controlled foreign corporation, somewhat of a specialty area that you can do further research on if you wanna be focusing in on those types of returns. You can enter on line 80 from your form 8992, the sum of any amounts reported on part two, line five. Remember to attach copies of your form 8992. You can obviously look at the instructions for form 8992 to drill down on more research there. Line 8P, 461I, excess business loss adjustment. Enter the amount of your excess business loss from form 461, line 16. So section 461I, this section of the Internal Revenue Code was introduced as part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, therefore relatively recent, and imposes limitations on the ability of non-corporate taxpayers to deduct expenses uh, to excess business losses. Now, you'll recall that the IRS is going to have more skepticism about people taking losses. The IRS is thinking of the taxpayer as though they are the silent partner of the taxpayer. The money that you earn, the IRS wants part of it. But if you lose money, they don't want to be responsible for that because that would be them paying you. And so they're going to be skeptical of the losses side of things typically. So excess business losses, what is that? An excess business loss occurs when the total deductions attributable to a taxpayer's trade or business exceed their total gross income and gains attributable to those trades or businesses plus a threshold amount. So what's the threshold amount? For tax year uh, 2023, the threshold amount for single taxpayers is 262,524,000 for married taxpayers filing jointly. Any losses exceeding this threshold are considered excess business losses. Now, the general idea of taking losses, you would say, well, if there's a loss on something, I should be able to get the, that loss against future income. We discussed this before. That makes kind of sense because like if I had to expend money this year and I actually lost money, then you would, you would think that if the IRS doesn't want to allow the loss this year, maybe I can take the loss against like future income would be one way to think about it. Or you might be able to take the loss in the current year against other income. So if you had W-2 income and business income, then you think you might be able to take the loss. But if the loss is quite large, the IRS is going to be becoming more and more skeptical about the deductibility of the losses, right? And this is going to become a political issue as well because you will often hear people saying, well, they, this, this person or this corporation didn't pay any taxes. What often is really happening in those situations is they had a loss in a prior year or something like that and they're taking the losses uh, against the income and so on. But in any case, limitations on deductions. Section 461I limits the taxpayer's ability to deduct excess business losses in the current tax year. Instead of being fully deductible, these losses may be subject to limitations and carried forward to future tax years, which is typically the case if you're basically denied the loss in uh, the current year, then you, then the next question would be, well, could I still get a benefit from the loss taking it against basically uh, future income? So reporting on line 8P, line 8P of the income tax summary likely involves reporting any adjustments made for the excess business loss under section 461I for tax year 2023. This adjustment may impact the taxpayer's taxable income. All right, and then we have line 8Q, uh, taxable distributions from an ABLE account. Distributions from this type of account may be taxable if A, they are more than the designated beneficiary's qualified disability expenses, and B, they are not excluded in a qualified rollover. So you can see publication 907 for more information. So we have another kind of tax favorable uh, type of, of tool being used here. And the typical thing to compare these types of tools to would be like an IRA, right? Because that's what most people kind of understand an IRA or a 401k plan where the IRS is trying to incentivize us to, uh, to in invest for our retirement and they possibly could give tax advantages of some uh, way, shape or form such as not allowing us or not having to include the income when we put the money into that uh, fund or having growth of it be tax-free, 
meaning if you get dividend and interest at being tax-free. The general questions, of course, whenever we have these kinds of tools are, what's gonna be the tax implications when I put money into the account? And what's gonna be the tax implications when that money grows, hopefully that will grow, with like dividends and interest, for example, and what are the tax consequences when I have to take the money out? Do I have to include it in income? And what are the penalties if I don't spend it on the things that the, that the IRS is basically trying to get us to spend it on, right? So caution, you may have to pay an additional tax if you received a taxable distribution from an ABLE account. So that's where our point of focus is here on the pulling the money out because the question is, is it something includable in income or not, right? So see the instructions for form 5329 for more detail there. So let's just give a little bit of a summary, ABLE accounts. So ABLE accounts are tax advantaged savings accounts for individuals with disabilities that allow them to save and invest money without, je uh, without jeopardizing eligibility for certain means tested government benefits such as Medicaid and Supplemental Social Security Income SSI. So we want to, so the idea when we, you deal with some of these benefit programs, uh, one of the concerns is, will it impact other benefit programs, which are often means tested or tested in terms of how much income someone has. And it, unfortunately, there's a negative incentive to actually have low income once you, once you get into this kind of range of area, because once your income goes up, then it will uh, possibly disqualify you for other types of benefits. So in any case, tax-free growth, contributions to ABLE accounts are made uh, with after-tax dollars and any earnings and growth within the account are typically not subject to federal income tax when used for qualified disability expenses. So remember the points in time when we have these kind of tools that the IRS is providing. One, is there a tax advantage when you put the money in? Two, is there a tax advantage on the growth of the money as it hopefully increases in value from dividends and interest capital gains and then three what's the tax is there a tax implication when you take the money out do you have to record it in income so here we have contributions to able accounts are made with after tax dollars and any earnings and growth within the account are typically not subject to federal income tax tax when used for qualified disability expenses. So there's the restriction, the catch, what we have to use them for. So taxable distributions. Generally distributions from an ABLE account are tax-free if they are used for qualified disability expenses, such as education, housing, transportation, healthcare, assistive technology, and other approved expenses related to, to the uh, designated beneficiary's disability. Non-qualified distributions. So if distributions from an ABLE account are used for non-qualified expenses, such, in, such uh, er, expenses, the earnings portion of the distribution may be subject to federal income tax and possibly 10% additional tax penalty. So clearly when these tools are set up, they are then potentials for abuse where people will try to abuse them. So the IRS is going to say, if you don't do that, then they're going to be subject to tax and then you might get hit with that 10 percent penalty in a similar fashion as we saw with like pulling money out early from like an ira reporting taxable distributions so taxable distributions from an able account are reported on the beneficiary's federal income tax returns the earnings portion of the distribution is reported as taxable income on the appropriate line of the tax return so form 1099q if taxable distributions are made from an ABLE account during the tax year, the financial institution managing the account will typically issue a 1099-Q to report the total distributions made during the year. So when you see that 1099, obviously the IRS, the typical idea, they're going to go after the one paying the money and say you need to, you need to give the information to the recipient in the form of a 1099 or W-2 or whatever it is, as well as to the IRS. So this form will indicate the amount of earnings distributed that may be subject to income tax. Exceptions. Some exceptions may apply to the taxation of distributions from ABLE accounts, such as rollovers, changes in the designated beneficiary, and other uh, special circumstances. So similar with the IRA, 
you end up with these funny situations oftentimes where people are strapped for cash. They have the cash, but it's under one of these accounts, like an ABLE or an education or an, or an IRA or a 401k. And there might be certain circumstances where you can pull the money out. Uh, and a rollover is a common scenario where you're going, where you're putting the money into another account, which would you would think would typically be under the same types of restrictions generally. Okay, so taxpayers should refer to IRS guidance and consult with tax professionals, obviously, with regards to setting those up. Line 8R, scholarship and fellowship grants, uh, grants not reported on Form W-2. Enter the amount of scholarship and fellowship grants not reported on Form W-2. However, if you were a degree candidate, include on line 8R only the amounts you used for expenses other than tuition and course-related expenses. For example, amounts used for room, board, and travel must be reported on line 8R. We'll talk about education benefits a little bit more in future presentations, but right now we're looking at the income line item and saying when might we have to include an item in income. So for tax year 2023, scholarship and fellowship grants are subject to specific income tax reporting requirements. Generally, these amounts are tax free. That's the good news, right? That's the general rule because the government, of course, is trying to incentivize education. Uh, if you are a candidate for a degree at an eligible educational institution and the funds are used for qualified educational expenses, what are those expenses? Generally, tuition, fees, books, supplies, equipment required for your courses. However, amounts used for incidental expenses like room and board, travel, and optional equipment must be included in gross income. So that's the thing we're kind of looking at here. You didn't use the money for the right thing and therefore it might have to be included in income in those situations, whereas it would not be if it was spent on like tuition perhaps. So the IRS publication 970 provides detailed guidance on the tax treatment of educational assistance, including scholarships, fellowship grants, grants and tuition uh, reductions. So we'll talk about some of those items in future presentations, including credits for education. For example, certain non-tuition fellowship and uh, stipend payments not reported on Form W-2 are treated as taxable compensation for IRA purposes. This publication also explains that emergency financial aid uh, grants under acts like the CARES Act, the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act 2021, and the American Rescue Plan Act 2021 are not included in your gross income. All right, let's take a look at line 8T. Pension or annuity from a non-qualified deferred compensation plan or a non-governmental section 457 plan. Enter the amount that you received as a pension or annuity from a non-qualified deferred compensation plan or a non-governmental uh, 457 plan. This may be shown in box 11 of the form W-2. So if you get the W-2, again, this is an area where it's somewhat unusual, but hopefully it'll be driven by the payer, in this case, possibly the employer will get the W-2 indicating the information in box 11 and can further our research for the data input in the software from there. So if you receive such amount, uh, but box 11 is blank, contact your employer or the payer for the amount received. So non-qualified deferred compensation plans. So these are contractual agreements between an employer and employee where part of the employee's income is paid out at a later date from when it was earned. So notice that for taxes, we typically are taxed kind of on a cash-based system when we receive the money. But the assumption is that we receive the money in the same period or pr approximately the same period that we earned it. You can imagine people trying to manipulate the tax code might just adjust the point in time that we get paid if it was a pure cash-based system and they can manipulate you know, uh, when they would have to record income. So the IRS is gonna create rules to basically stop people from doing that kind of tax planning strategy by just manipulating when payments are gonna be paid to people. 
So income is thus deferred and is usually designed as uh, a form of long-term compensation or retirement plan. This kind of plan does not have to comply with the Employee Retirement Income Security Act uh, guidelines that apply to qualified plans like a 401k plan. So they offer uh, greater flexibility, but also some with higher risk as deferred compensation is typically unsecured. So the 401k plan is kind of like the standard, but it's more complex and you have less flexibility with it. So that's when you might have this non-qualified deferred compensation plan, which could have more flexibility, but then comes with more risk because it's less standardized and so on. So this means that if the company faces financial trouble, employees may not be able to claim the deferred compensation. This becomes a problem if all your money is in the retirement plan. We saw this with like Enron way back when, and then the company goes bankrupt and <laughs> they, and your investments are in such a format that you can't pull the money out. Uh, that's why, off, well, in any case, I won't get into that now. So you might have this kind of income if you're an executive or other high earning employee who has elected to defer part of your compensation to a future date, often to manage tax liabilities or plan for retirement. So it's usually for higher income, more complex returns. Uh, Non-governmental section five, uh, four, five, seven plans, similar to NQDCs. These are plans that allow employees of nonprofit organizations and some governmental entities to defer income taxation on retirement savings. The funds are contributed to the plan pre-tax and can grow tax deferred until withdrawal. So these are often used by employees and tax exempt organizations uh, to augment their retirement savings. One key feature is that these plans are required to remain unfunded, meaning the assets are not set aside exclusively for beneficiaries, but remain part of the employer's general assets and could be subject to creditors claim if the employer became insolvent. So again, that's a characteristic of the type of plans. So these income types are generally subject to tax when the compensation is received or made available to the participant rather than when it is first deferred. They offer ways for individuals, especially those in higher income brackets to manage their current and future income tax situations more strategically. All right, line eight, U, wages earned while incarcerated. So enter the amount that you received for services performed while an inmate in a penal institution. So if you're doing taxes or have to do taxes as a member of a penal institution, you're basically in jail. Uh, then uh, you can you can take a look at that for more detail. So you may receive form W-2 or a 1099 in that situation. Line 8Z, other income. Use line 8Z to report any taxable income not reported elsewhere on your return or other schedules. List the type of income, uh, amount and income. So now we're just have the most generic line. Other income, I couldn't put it anywhere else. Now note that if you find income that you can't put anywhere else, then often the question is gonna be, is this income subject to self-employment tax or something like that? in which case it might go on a Schedule C or something, or if not subject to self-employment tax, in which case you wanna make sure that you're not uh, paying self-employment tax, Social Security and Medicare, which is like the equivalent of payroll taxes. All right, list the type and amount of income. If, uh, if necessary, include a statement showing the required information. For more details, see miscellaneous income in publication 525, which you could find on the IRS website, explains uh, of income to report on line 8Z include the following. So reimbursement or other amounts received for items deducted in an earlier year, such as medical expenses, real estate taxes, general sales tax, or home mortgage interest. So this is that situation, for example, where you got a deduction last year, and it's similar to the, to the, uh, to the state tax deduction, where we saw, well, what if you overpaid the state tax then you get the deduction when you paid it in the current year and the following year you get a refund. Well, if you got a refund, you shouldn't have taken the deduction, right? So what do you have to do? Do I have to amend the prior year return where I got the deduction because they refunded the money to me? That would be too complex. The easy thing to do would be to say, well, if you got a deduction last year, you have to include it in income this year. So you're gonna deal with the taxes, but you don't have to amend the prior return. Similar idea with other types of things that you might have got a refund for. If you got a tax benefit on it last year, 
then instead of amending the return, then maybe you can include it in income in the current year to even things out. So uh, reemployment trade adjustment assistance, RTAA payments, these payments should be shown uh, in box five of form 1099G, so you should get a form for that. Uh, loss on certain corrective distributions of excess deferrals, see uh, retirement plan contributions, publication 525, dividends and insurance policies if they exceed the total of all net premiums you paid uh, for the contract. So dividends and insurance policies if they exceed the total net premiums. So, so now you've got you know, the premium, the pay came out that's higher than the premiums. Okay, recapture of charitable contribution deductions relating to the contribution of a fractional interest in tangible personal property. See fractional interest in tangible personal property in publication 526 for more detail there. Recapture of a charitable contribution deduction if the charitable organization disposes of the donated property within three years of the contribution. So in other words, that you, you don't fulfill the requirements in a certain type of contribution. And so now you took again the deduction in the prior year what do you do, amend the prior year return or possibly you can fix it in the current year. Taxable part of disaster relief payments. See publication 525 to figure the taxable part, if any, if any of your disaster relief payment is taxable, attach a statement showing the total payment received and how to figure the taxable part. So taxable distributions from a Coverdale education savings account. This is another one of those tools you can think of as kind of similar to like an IRA, right? Where we have the situation we're putting our money into this tool. And the question is, is it taxable when I put the money in? Do I get a tax benefit? Is the growth of the money taxable when I take the money out? Is there a tax implication at that point in time? Okay, so a Coverdale savings account or a qualified tuition program. Distributions from these accounts may be taxable if, so that's what we're looking at here, the distribution, the money coming out, because the question is, is there an income tax thing that you have to include on the income line item? A, in the case of distributions from a QTP, they are more than a qualified higher education expenses of the designated beneficiary in 2023. So you got the money out, you're supposed to use it for in this case, education, you got more money than you used for education. Therefore, you know, you would think you would have to include it in income. So in the case of distributions from an ESA, they are more than the qualified education expenses of the designated beneficiary in 2023. And B, they were not included in a qualified rollover. So you will recall if we just roll over the money, it's still under kind of the umbrella, you would think, and therefore shouldn't be a taxable event but might be having to be reported. So non-taxable distribution from these accounts don't have to be reported on Form 1040 or 1040SR. Uh, this includes rollovers and qualified higher education expenses refunded to a student from QTP that were recontributed to a QTP with the same designated beneficiary generally within 60 days after the date of refund. So for more information about that, you can see uh, publication 970. Non-taxable income. Don't report any non-taxable income on line 8Z. Examples of non-taxable income include the following. You have the child support. So, so remember, these are things that are excluded from income. Everything is included in income unless the IRS says otherwise. That's their general ID, idea. Child support is typically something that's going to be a payment from one person to the other. It's not alimony. Child support not typically included and in income. Alimony, as we talked about before, oftentimes is also not included for later years, but that there's that cutoff year. Payments you received to help you pay your mortgage loan under an, FA, an HFA hardest hit fund or the homeowner assistance fund. So payments you received to help you pay your mortgage, which would you would think would be kind of like an assistant program, or you can think of it kind of as a forgiveness of debt in some ways or something like that. But again, because of insolvency and programs might not be something subject to tax and therefore not included or excluded from income. So any pay for performance success payments that reduce the principal balance of your home mortgage under the home affordable modification program, life insurance proceeds received 
because of someone's death other than from certain employer owned life insurance. That's the one that comes up fairly often, a life insurance program. If it's a normal setup process in a family situation, husband dies, work to death, life insurance is there. So, so usually the life insurance is not something included uh, uh, in, in income, although there are exceptions for certain employer owned life insurance. So gifts and bequests. Uh, so you may have to report information on your gifts or be or bequests bequests on form uh, 3520 part number four if you received a gift uh, or be bequest bequeathed from a foreign individual or foreign estate including foreign persons related to that foreign individual or foreign estate totaling more than 100,000 or amounts totaling more than 18,000 uh, 567 from a foreign corporation or foreign partnership, including foreign persons related to such foreign corporations that you treated as gifts. Now, remember the whole gifts thing uh, is complicated because it's tied to the estate tax. So the general idea is we have an income tax. We tax people when they earn the income. So, so then the question is, well, what if someone dies? Well, if someone dies, then we shouldn't you would think we wouldn't tax them when they die because because the income had already been taxed when they earned it but they're going to give that money to somebody else meaning the inheritance right so the in inheritance you could think of the inheritance as income to the recipient although again they didn't really earn it it's a gift right it's going from the dead person to the other to the to their inheritor their children oftentimes uh, but the IRS of course wants a piece of that so they have the death tax or estate tax. Now, the estate tax means that, that they're actually going to tax the balance sheet instead of income. So when someone dies, they pile all their money up in a, a pile and then they rake away, you know, certain part of it for taxes and whatnot. So, so obviously to get out of estate taxes, if the government's going to do that, they're going to try to give all their money away on their deathbed. And the IRS doesn't want them to give all the money on the way on their deathbed because then when they die, they won't be able to pick their pockets. So that means that they have to uh, tie together gifts and estate taxes, which is kind of, again, a more wealthy individual state planning uh, type of tax situation. All right. We also have the Form 1099-K loss reporting. So if you sold a personal item at a loss, uh, either report the loss on Form 8949 or report it on line 8Z. So if you report the loss on line 8Z, enter the amount of the sale proceed from Form 1099-K on line 8Z. So 1099-K is a type of 1099 you might receive. Uh, and then again, the question would be, if you received it, where am I going to basically report that? Is it something that, re that report on Form 8949 or possibly on other income line 8Z? So in the entry space next to line 8Z, write Form 1099-K, personal items sold at a loss, and also enter the amount of the sale proceeds. For example, you bought a couch for $1,000 and sold it through a third-party vendor for $700, which was reported on uh, Form 1099-K. In the entry space next to line 8Z, you would write Form 1099-K, personal items sold at a loss, $700, see the instructions for line 24z now the issue there is that you had a loss but you're going to have a 1099 so the 1099 went to the irs the irs has it if you don't put it somewhere on your return then the irs is going to assume that you had income that you didn't report so you have to put it somewhere so the irs can recognize it so incorrect 1099k this is, became an issue they're getting better at it but the irs is trying to hit the 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 best person to issue the 1099, which is getting complicated because you can see the normal process is usually they look at the payer of the 1099, the employer, for example, or the person that paid in a, in, in a contractor situation. But with gig work, for example, it becomes complex because the platforms are, the, are not really an employer or a contractor in the same kind of sense. So then the question is, who has to pay the money? Is it, is it, or send the 1099? Is it the gig work platform, which is really just a communication hub, uh, which would really bog things down? Or is it the PayPal people of the world, the intermediary, intermediary transfers? 
the credit card companies, and those kind of financial institutions. So the, the problem is you might get a wrong 1099 or you might get two 1099s, in which case it would double your income. How do you fix that? Well, you, can't go, you don't wanna to go to the IRS unless that's the last resort. You wanna fix it at the issuer of the 1099 because you need to get them to get the proper amount to the government so that you can match it on your end so that the IRS doesn't question you about it, right? So if you receive a form 1099-K that shows payments you didn't receive or is otherwise incorrect uh, and you can't get it corrected, enter the amount uh, from form 1099-K that was incorrectly reported. So now we're saying, I tried to fix it. I tried to go to the issuer. They won't fix it. So what I'm going to do is, again, I'm going to tell the IRS, hey, look, here's the amount of the 1099. I want to show you it so that you recognize it, but it's wrong. So in the entry space next to the line 8Z, write, quote, incorrect form 1099-K and also enter the amount that was incorrectly reported to you. So for example, if you received a form 1099-K that was incorrectly showing $800 of payments to you, you would enter $800 on line 8Z and in the entry space next to line 8Z, you would write incorrect form 1099-K, $800 see instructions for line 20 uh 24 z for more information